Hello, welcome. You're listening to the What to Heck podcast, or you may be watching the Danny to Heck YouTube channel. Have you been scammed by Hyperverse? Do you know what Hyperverse is? Do you know who owns Hyperverse or Hibernation? Well, there's a lot of people out there at the moment that actually want to take legal action against the company. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's not even really a company. Even though they did start from a company called Hypertech Group, they don't actually have any company. So the company founders were what we've been told were actually two people, and that was Ryan Zhu and Sam Lee. So recently, I've been hanging out on Telegram, something I didn't think I'd actually ever be doing. I actually hated the program. But now I've found myself an admin in a group called Hyperverse Lawsuit. And the people that are in the group, it's only about 500 people, they actually want to take legal action against this Ponzi scheme. And I keep upsetting people. Now, if you have invested in a Ponzi scheme, and you have realized that you've actually lost your money, it can be a pretty hard pill to swallow. And I don't want to be responsible for people's mental health because it can be devastating when you lose money. So if you are feeling um, down and you don't know who to talk to, reach out to a neighbor or a close friend and uh, tell them how you're feeling and get some help if you are feeling down. Because it's not a nice thing when somebody told you something that was technically too good to be true, and then you find out it's not true. So these two people, Ryan and Sam, they do have a history of being involved in crypto companies. But my feeling is, unless the world unites and we all start working as one entity, it's a very hard thing to put together a lawsuit that can actually do any good. And I honestly believe that these two people are either already in a Chinese prison somewhere or hiding and will never be able to get them. But because this Ponzi scheme has actually grown since 2019, it started off as uh, Hyper Capital and then they rebranded to Hyper Fund and then in December this year it changed to Hyperverse and then just on the 22nd of August, they're still going, they've changed it to Hypernation. And there's a lot of people that have made a lot of money out of it. And they have now recruited teams of people, and they've all trusted each other because they've been like a true Ponzi scheme. They receive a little bit of the money that they said they're going to, and they're all in. They have been rebuying, putting their money and leaving their money in, and now they suddenly realize that it's got no money left and the terrible fact is they've actually could have lost, or well, they have lost all their money. There's no doubt about that now, and people are really starting to know about that. So I don't believe it's achievable to actually sue Ryan and Sam. I think it's a, uh, a, a, a it's just impossible. So my suggestion, which is the one that's causing all the problems, is to actually hire a lawyer. And write a letter to the person that introduced you to it and demand they give back your initial investment. Because Hyperverse is encouraging people to buy these NFTs for $100, $125, $10,000 and $100,000. And then they were saying to people that once they get these NFTs, they'll have a passport. They'll be able to go onto the new Ponzi scheme platform called Hypernation. And then the company said that they would... um, make sure they got their one times reward back. So if you put a thousand dollars in and you signed up for this new platform, you would uh, get your thousand dollars back if you hadn't already. All the reward money that had grown in there, basically uh, they would negotiate with that with you. That's what they said. Everyone jumped over. 70,000 people decided to buy a $100 NFT. I think a thousand people bought a $10,000 uh, NFT, and now they're realizing that even the rewards and the, the whole structure of the company in Hypernation, the new one, they haven't delivered, they haven't said anything they're going to do. So people are really angry. So I said, you're not going to get your initial investment back from the company because there's no money there. So I said, if I encourage someone to get involved in a Ponzi scheme, like my neighbor, and then I knew it fell over and I was still actively promoting it, if you want your money back, 
hire a lawyer to write a letter to them telling that you're going to take them to court if they don't give you your initial money back. That's my take on it. I think that would be a great strategy if you're desperate to get your initial investment back. Initial investments could range anything from, you know, $400, $800, and $1,200. However, because the ploy, why that wouldn't work so well is a lot of people that are investing in it uh, um, uh, have been recommended by a friend or a family member or a colleague. So it's a wee bit embarrassing if you want to take them to court. So it might not work. So this is my nice way of saying there's nothing you can really do. Now on this Telegram group that I'm part of, there is a few links where you can actually um, you can actually submit your case to a government organisation. The government organisation, you won't be able to see this if you're on the podcast, but it's called Ponzi Schemes Using Virtual Currencies. And in this document, it basically describes everything that hyperverse and hypernation is, and you should stay away from them. And there's lots of flags, and they give you a lot of key indicators for you to um, look at to basically say that this was a Ponzi scheme and you shouldn't have got invested in it in the first place. However, hindsight is a wonderful thing. So I think I've broken it down to three things you could do. So you could go after the person that initially introduced you to it, which may not be nice, but then you might see that person who, say if I... Mary Poppins down the road, she knocked on my door one day and she said, I've got an investment opportunity for you. I'm not a financial advisor, but I think it will be right up your alley. They're going to give you three times your rewards, uh, so three times your investment in rewards, and you can take those rewards out, turn them back into cash if you want. And then um, and then I, I realise it's a Ponzi scheme and I lose my money. I go back to Mary Poppins down the road and I say, hey, you lost my, my, my money. And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, well, that happens. That's all part of investing. So you, you think, oh, right. and then you see her down the road promoting other Ponzi schemes. And you think, oh, my goodness, a lady is rampant. She just does this for a living. You'd want to go after her, wouldn't you? You do. So you could go after the individual that basically recommended it to you. All right, that's just my take on it. I think it's a great idea. You'd get your initial investment back from most of them. A lot of people, when they get a lawyer's letter, freak out, and they'll give you your $400, $800, or $1,200 back. Done. You've got your money back. You've got you've lost nothing, just a whole lot of time and energy. The other one we could do, as we said, we could go after Ryan and Sam. But what I've been doing, personally, is I've been naming, shaming people who are actively promoting it. So at the moment, we've got, um, I'm going to read out a few names, Kalpish Patel, Keith Williams, Amanda Lee, Clayton Ford, Roman, I can't say his last name. Brenda Chanda, which is called, I don't know what this actually means, to be honest, AKA. Uh, she's called Bitcoin Beauty. And then you've got Rodney Burton, AKA Bitcoin Rodney. Did you know his real name? And then you've got Goldman Henstorm, Mickey McClaney, I can't even say, and Pinnicky Nark. That's what I always say. That's always so. Now, these guys are rampant. Now, originally, back in 2019, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos. And you can see that there was originally, um, you know, five VIP fives. And as they've rebranded, reskinned, and learned stuff, these guys that are actively promoting this Ponzi scheme to people and recruiting teams of people on how to recruit other people, you know, it all grew like mold. And these guys are all millionaires. So would it make you happy if these guys were all swooped up and, um, you know, questioned by the authorities? and then put um, in prison. Would that make you happy? Or would you be happy with your neighbour just repaying you your money? Or would you be happy to see Sam and Ryan locked up? Or all the active people? Now, when I read out that list of people who have been promoting this in, in Zoom meetings, a lot of people will be thinking, oh, he hasn't mentioned this guy, he hasn't mentioned that guy, he hasn't mentioned them. There's meant to be 500 people. Now, each VIP5 has actually recruited 2,000 people into it. Each VIP5 has actually sold, um, or not sold, but um, has 2,000 members under them. Now, the minimum investment is $400. That actually equates to $8 million. If you times $8 million by 500, this is a $4 billion scam. Now, numerous people have contacted me and told me that they have invested $80,000. Some people have put a little bit of money in, tested the water, got a little bit of money out, system works, all in, and then they look at their monopoly money and they just keep reinvesting. The company keeps promising things, they never deliver, and they keep telling them to put more money in, and uh, it's just a terrible Ponzi scheme. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, 
um, if you go back to my original idea, I've got notes here, I'm reading them. Um, you could just go after the person, a family friend, but it'd be very hard to do that. What else have I got in here? All right, so let's say, um, no, Brenda Chanda, she was on the leadership meeting on the 3rd of December 2022. And she was basically saying she's been flogged to death in the chat rooms, like in the Telegram group, by people who are really negative, and, and she's telling people to be more positive. And also she's telling her, us that she's finding things really hard. She's had to travel business, um, you know, try to travel in on a budget and all this sort of stuff. And then just after that meeting ended, somebody f sent me a photo, and she's off promoting um, a new platform called EasyBot, which is an affiliate marketing system that's got um, packages which are very similar to memberships. And then you've got Kalpesh Patel, who is now promoting other Ponzi schemes like WeWe Global. Uh, Keith is still manning the boat for Hyperverse, and um, he's telling people that they can be in Hyperverse or they can be in Hypernation. But after you've done 100 videos like I have, you've basically seen there's a lot of people being fooled, lied to continuously, and it's just becoming a way of life. So I'm using this video to sort of suggest that if you were going to take legal action against Hyperverse, you probably need to ask a few questions, and I've got a few questions. Has there actually been a crime? If so, what exactly is the crime? Now, just pretend I'm a lawyer, and you've gone to a lawyer, or you've got a team of lawyers, and they ask you that question. How would you answer? Has there been a crime? And what exactly is it? All right? So you answer that question in the comments if you want to. So in the normal world, we would read advertising. And advertising make false claims. The advertising bureau would go after them. So buy one steak knife, get 10 steak knives. And you order that steak knife and it turns up in the mail and there's one big steak knife and there's 10 little tiny dinky ones you would think, oh, I just got ripped off. And then you didn't read the fine print. So what advertising did Hyperverse actually do um, that they didn't deliver on? And I'm not saying they haven't or have. I just want to be a lawyer and ask that question to you. What advertising claim did they say? We all know they said that you'd get three times your initial investment back in 600 days. And you were, yeah, well, anyway, so that, that was what they said you'd get. But was there anything else around that? What other advertising did they put out there? And did you actually get what they said? And if I was a lawyer, I'd be asking the date the transaction happened between the buyer and seller. When did this actually happen? Now, the reason I asked that question is because you could actually purchase a membership and then you get rewards in your account. And when those rewards mature, you have a choice. You could at one stage convert them into another crypto and convert them out of the platform and put them onto Binance or Coinbase and turn them back into USDT, USDT or buy Bitcoin with them if you wanted to. You could do anything you like with them and then take them out put them back in your bank. So, um, but, or you could rebuy. And if you rebuy, then you would accumulate and you would have more at the time it was called HU in your account. Now, one guy I know, he put 5000 in and then he got his initial $5,000 out and then he played with his winnings, so to speak. And the other day he said he has $105 US thousand dollars in his rewards account that he cannot withdraw because there's no money left. So... The transaction dates, you would have to provide the transaction dates. Now, the lawyer might actually say, well, actually, we can only go after the initial investment money because that's the money that you've invested or the crypto you've invested. The reward money may be subject to other things in their terms and conditions. I don't know. I'm just asking that question. Right. Did you use the product or service they provide provided? So were you a member? Did you have membership benefits? Did you use the product or service that they provided? And, you know, like if you walked in and bought my new uh, active wear, um, what is their refund policy? So if you buy something, you don't like it, like you buy a garment, you can normally go back in there and they all have a refund policy. They may not. Um, they may do. They may say, look, we're going to repack the goods that you have 
opened, we're going to charge you 20% packaging fee. That's quite common. Proof of purchase. Now, if I was a lawyer, I'd be saying, right, prove to me that you made payment for this product on a certain day. So to purchase the membership plan, you needed to convert your money into um, USDT and you were sent a wallet address. So you'd need to find the transaction date that you actually paid this money so you can prove that you did actually pay the money and where it went. So proof of purchase. What is the timeline? So that would be an interesting thing to go down, wouldn't it? Like, when was the first transaction done? And what was the date of the dispute? When did you actually realize that there was a problem? When did you think you weren't happy and you needed to hire a lawyer? Now, the reason I say that question is because, let's think about this. If you're still on the platform and you're still hopeful that the company is um, going to put money in and actually do what they say, why are you disputing it? Why don't you give the company more times? Once again, what does their terms and conditions say about being patient? Because there's a lot of talk on the Zoom meetings um, saying that we just need to be patient. So why are you now saying that the company has fallen over? Is it because in their terms and conditions, they said that you could regularly withdraw your money? I know they did put a limit on it at a time where you had to have 50 HU in your account before you could transfer it into an exchange. This is similar to the last question. Are you still engaged with the company? Are you still using their services? Are you still moving things around? So this particular company has actually had membership one, and when they realized they were bleeding money, they switched, asked people to switch to membership two but they had a whole lot of new terms and conditions. Instead of 600 days before you got your three times investment, they increased the membership plans $100, and then they told people that it's going to be four times the investment, and it's going to take 1,330 days um, for this money to be four times. So that means you're nearly twice as long. And the other thing, they had new terms and conditions, and in those terms and conditions, I think they were getting out of jail from the first terms and conditions. And now they're encouraging everyone to move over to hibernation. Once again, they have a completely new um, set of rules, don't they? Well, do they? Do you Have you seen those rules? And what did you actually purchase? Now, I watched quite a few of these meetings, and I know that they're quite smug, the, um, the presenters, the people doing the presentations. So did you purchase um, an investment? Or did you, what did you actually purchase? A membership. And they liken it to a membership that you'd get by owning a credit card and you get rewards. So what did you actually purchase? If it's just a membership, it's going to be hard for a lawyer, I presume, to actually do anything about it. Now, the other thing they, the lawyer may ask is, did they sabotage the business? Does it look like they defrauded the company? Did it look like somebody... Um, brought the company down? Did they work in good faith? You know, can you prosecute someone who was trying hard to keep their business going? I mean, I don't know. I'm just using Danny brain here. But I mean, did they bring the business down intentionally? Was it just the way, because they, they had a few excuses, like cryptos crashed. Um, they said that the, the, um, they had a flaw in the system and their own VIPs were creating multiple accounts and all that sort of stuff. So did they sabotage the business or did the members, did they get robbed? I mean, is it out of their control what actually happened? Um, you know, can you prosecute a company? Did they provide a product or a service is what I'd be asking as a lawyer. I'm not going to dwell on that one too much, but I have to actually say that they didn't have any income stream. So if you did your due diligence, you may have actually seen that they didn't have any money coming in other than from selling memberships. So what was the product or service? That actually might be a better question. What was the product or service that they sold you? And how was the transaction done? Was it uh, in um, a company office somewhere or was it at a meeting room? Um, did you sign some paperwork? 
um, if it's all online and done via the computer, watch the website address that you went to, um, you know, write down and explain the whole process of what's actually happening. Did you sign an agreement? A pretty simple question. What agreement did you sign? Now, just from my experience, I did actually sign up for Hyperverse. And when they come to the part of asking for the referrer's code, I just made it up and it still let me create an account. I've never purchased a membership account, but I do have full access to the Hyper community area and I also have full access to um, Hyper versus back end. I just logged in the other day to check that to see if I still did. But I can't remember actually seeing any agreement that I had to sign when I actually sent the crypto um, to the wallet address they provide. But I would be interested to see that disclaimer. Oh, here we go. Did you read the disclaimer? Because they would probably argue the fact that they do have a disclaimer. And I do realize that when you're watching the PowerPoint presentations, I'm not sure if the disclaimer is there to protect the company or the person reading it out. All right, so did you read the disclaimer? And if you did, and it says that disclaimer that it wasn't a financial investment, it was not a, what do they call it? Investment opportunity. And it, it says they cannot guarantee performance going by past performance and all that sort of stuff. And then the big question you really want to ask where your lawyer will ask you, is the disclaimer legally binding? If somebody reads you out a disclaimer, is it legally binding? Or should they print that out and have you sign that so that and initial the pages like you do when you're going for a bank loan? You know what that's like. You sign about 50,000 pieces of paper, don't you? Right, the lawyer's now going, right, whereabouts is this business located? Now, there's a problem with crypto companies uh, at the moment. Uh, they are trying to, um, I've heard that Dubai, where a lot of people who run Ponzi schemes live, because that's where the, um, Kalpesh Patel has ran off to, and we don't know where Ryan or, or Sam is, uh, have heard that he's meant to be in Southern California, <laughs> but I, it's only um, rumours. But yeah, so where is the business located uh, that you invested in? Where? How do you find this company? How do you knock on their door? How do you look them up? Um, and I, Now, have they got a registered company number? Uh, you know, I know if you went to the New Zealand company office and you search for Danny De Heck, you'll find I have a registered company. And you can even find my lawyers and you can find my accountant's address. So what is their company number? Because I think you would need that if you wanted to prosecute these people. Um, who is the CEO? Time for a little bit of funny stuff. Is it still Stephen Reese Lewis? I mean, this guy fronted us about seven times from memory on YouTube with a video. Stephen Reese Lewis. Now, whereabouts is he? I've heard that he's in Thailand, but no one's actually ever seen him physically. He has uh, two Twitter accounts or one Twitter account, and that could be managed by anybody. So who's the CEO? Who's responsible? Who actually committed the crime? If we were to point a finger at someone, who would we point it at? Is there an individual or is it a company? Because if they're not a company then we need to default back to an individual. So who was it? And was it a crime? Is it a crime what they've done by not giving you your rewards? Was it a promise on a handshake? You know, is it Ryan Ju? We don't know. He's never f confronted the company. He's never really talked about his baby hyper fun, hyper capital, hyperverse, hyper hypernation, if hypernation is part of him, because it does seem like a completely different entity. And if he's already in prison, then what are we doing this lawsuit for? Is it for revenge? And if it is revenge, you want justice done. So why don't we go after all the people that are involved? Everyone that's been promoting it, there's still people today who are actively promoting it via Zoom. So who has actually committed the crime? Is it Sam Lee? Are they holding the funds? Where is the money? They always say, follow the money. So why are they withholding your money? If you are entitled to the money that you see in the back end of their system and it's reward money that you can convert to uh, HVT, then um, 
Why are they holding? What is their reasoning for not giving you the money? And the other question, which they may all seem pretty similar, what illegal activity had they done? Why is this illegal? Is it illegal not to pay people their rewards? Might be a silly question. Got to think about it, though. You know, what illegal activity had they done? Like, if, um, if I drove my car and I was drunk, the illegal activity would be DIC, drunk in charge of a vehicle. Right, so what crime have they done? Is this internet crime, internet fraud? Is this financial advice? Uh, well, not advice, but is it financial? What crime are you actually wanting to get them done for? Fraud? And if it is fraud, then what fraud have they done? You know, that's the sort of question we're getting into there. Is it legal to promote a Ponzi scheme? So in your country, it may be legal to promote a Ponzi scheme. In New Zealand, we have, um, it's illegal to promote a Ponzi scheme. And it's also illegal to market or introduce people to multi-level marketing. So that's, that's something I would be looking at. So that could be the illegal activity they have done. It's a Ponzi scheme, multi-level marketing. And I did have another thought that just escaped my mind. Um, is it a Ponzi scheme or multi-level marketing? Can't remember. Mustn't have been that good. All right. Um, were you deceived? Like, were they, did they lie to you or did they mislead you? Or, you know, this is what a lawyer may ask. Like, you've got the crime, they've done a crime, but were you deceived? Like, did they not tell you all the facts? Or did they tell you everything about it? Did they tell you it was definitely, like, um, like I'll, I'll go on to the next question. Was there a money-back guarantee? Now, I provide guarantees with some of the things that I do. Now, I have to provide a guarantee I, I do drop shipping, so I have to provide a, um, a guarantee as per the Consumers Act guarantee. So if I deliver a product like a TV remote, let's pick up one of those for those people. In the, yep, I sell some of those, and it's faulty and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work for the purpose it was designed and intended. Legally, I have to give that product back. So did they offer a money back guarantee or a guarantee for rewards? Some of the people I've been speaking to said they did initially, but as the membership plans changed, they did away with it and no one actually noticed. And then the other thing too, let's say my, go back to my TV remote, you can't see on my podcast, but if this is faulty, do I have to give a refund? No, I don't. I don't have to give a refund. I have to remedy the situation. That means I can either offer to get a courier to deliver this TV remote back to you uh, sorry, back to me, so I can have my technical people look at it and fix it, or even if it's taken you know, a long time to get to you initially, I can just say, look, very sorry, the remote's no good, I'm going to order you another one. So that means that it's a fair and reasonable conclusion. So you've got to think, the lawyer's going to be saying to you, have they provided a remedy? And they may argue the fact that they've provided hypernation, even though they're encouraging you guys to reinvest and give you more USDT and uh, and just milk you dry, um, have they provided a remedy? Right, as a consumer, you also have some responsibilities. Is that a consumer? Is that the right word? Have I used the right word? So I'm going to ask you some questions, and there's only three of them. Did you investigate this opportunity? I mean, if I'm going to go and buy a new pair of jeans, am I going to buy them... You know, in a, yeah, I'm going to walk into a shop. I'm going to have a look around. I'm going to read their terms and conditions. I'm going to have a look at their refund policy. And then I'm going to see, test the quality of the jeans. I'll do a bit of due diligence, aren't I? I'm going to see if these jeans are any good. And then I'm going to go and ask a few questions. Um, I might even do a few searches on the internet and find some YouTube channels saying, don't get invested in this Ponzi scheme. However, did you investigate this opportunity? Because that I believe that's your responsibility to invest it. You know, did they make you aware of any risk? And that's a very good question, isn't it? Did they make you aware of any risk? I have paused because I do these talkovers on these videos, and I actually have 
stopped and listened to their disclaimer and the risks that they are telling you you're about to take. And it blows me away that people still will invest in these companies. Initially, it wasn't really about the three times reward. It was basically about the vision that Ryan Zhu had. And he wanted people to be in the community and he was rewarding people for being in his community. And they said, because I listened to the video just the other day that was two years old, that they wanted to reward people for being in the community. Rather than going out and do advertising and attract people, they basically wanted to buy their community. So it wasn't initially a three times return on your investment, it was rewards. So there was risks. What were the risks about getting the rewards? It's probably in the disclaimer. I don't know. I haven't listened to it word for word. Well, I have, but I can't remember. Did you... Um, window. What was that? Compromise. Oh, I don't even know what that word is. I can't read my own writing. One minute, please, caller. Did your common sense go out the window? Oh, that's not very nice. Did your common sense go out the window? Did the reward look so good that you didn't think you'd do any due diligence? So that's my what responsibility did... Um, did you have? Next one, in the company's defense, what would they say? Now think about this. Now if you were Ryan Zhu or Sam Lee and you've had 1,600,000 people invest in you and you were standing in front of a judge and you had the lawyer um, asking you questions, um, what defense do you think they would use against you Let's ask, I've got four questions here. Did they offer any guarantees? So they could say, look, we didn't offer anyone guarantees. In fact, we said we're going to try to set up a um, something on the metaverse, and we said we'll give it our best shot, but we need your money, your crypto, because we're burning it like a, yep, well, you, you know what they've done with your money. It's all in Dubai, just saying. Anyway, um, then they would say, we showed you a disclaimer. And the disclaimer, they'd probably bring that out and say, look, the disclaimer says blah, 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 blah. Now, as I said earlier on, does that disclaimer actually stand up in court if they got to court, if you can find them? And then, in that disclaimer, they'll probably say, we told them it wasn't an investment opportunity. So imagine that. I, I come to you and I say, hey, mate, can I borrow 300 bucks of you? And they go, yep. I said, look, I'm going to have a go at trying to make this $900. I'm going to give it back to you in... 600 days. You would say, great. Um, but it's not an investment opportunity. It's a, it's a gamble. That's the conditions that you can loan me this money. Okay. Sounds great to me. Worth a punt. You know, little in, big return. It's like gambling, isn't it? It is. And then they might say, well, we've actually tried to remedy the situation. That's the fourth question. But the customer's not been reasonable. Are you being reasonable? Have you had enough patience? Have you given them a long time? Because what I've been hearing in these new meetings is they're telling people they don't see the bigger picture. And to my dread, in the last um, talk over I did with the video just before this one about hibernation, they've got a business plan that goes out to 2026. So they're actually asking you, they've got a big four-year plan. So maybe the remedy is that you should all trust that they know what they're doing, even though they've failed in the last three Ponzi schemes, and now they've started up number four, if it is. And we don't even know if Ryan, Drew, and Sam's in this one, because they haven't said anything about them. But now they're saying that if you give us another four years, um, we may be able to get you out of the strife. So that might be the remedy, and that might be the out. Do you think that would stand up in court? I don't know. So in conclusion, that's all my questions. I hope I haven't upset people. Honestly, I, I've done a lot of effort promoting these Ponzi schemes um, on my YouTube channel. I've spent hours. Most videos I do take me at least 10 hours to do. And I haven't received a return on my investment either. It's not really a profitable business being a YouTuber. Maybe one day, but at the moment it hasn't. But I actually like... Um, you know, uh, talking <laughs> to myself. So in conclusion, um, I'm not really having a go at anyone. Um, especially if you did think it was a good opportunity, I get it. I'm into passive incomes myself. I've been self-employed for over 25 years. I've imported products 
I have sold them. I have um, done affiliate marketing in 2004. I made $100,000 worth of affiliate sales in two and a half months. thought I was going to be rich. You know, so I know how to hustle online. I get it. And I provide online workshops. That didn't work. But I'm now doing YouTubing to see if I can make that my business. And as I said earlier on, I do drop shipping. So I'm always side hustle. I think, you know, being an entrepreneur is the joy of my life. I get it. But, you know, you know, some things are too good to be true. Now, the world we live in is actually a new world, isn't it? We've had two years of COVID. It's been quite hard being isolated. You know, our comfort is actually getting on these Zoom meetings and talking to other people. I mean, I owned a business networking company and it had 150 members and they were split into eight groups. And every Tuesday morning, I would get up at 7.30 in the morning and run a meeting for an hour. I'd get 15 to 20 people in a group and I'd help them network. We'd have a presentation and I'd get them to sit there and talk for five minutes each to a group of um, six people on a table. And then at 9.30, I'd run another meeting and then I'd do that all week. And then on Friday, I'd run a think tank meeting. And it was a really good thing. I spent eight years building up that company. And each member used to pay $60 a month to be a member. And it was bringing in, it was bringing in my income. And then when COVID happened, uh, I basically tried to make or help or get everyone on Zoom. And I just watched the life trained out of them. And I eventually, these days, I have around about 15 members. And I haven't got... The, the power in me to build that company back up again. And no doubt you maybe experience the same thing. You may be tired, perplexed, and exhausted. You may have invested your money. You may have really believed these people in the Zoom meetings that said that you can basically get a quick return on your investment. You may have also burnt the bridge with a few people. Uh, I had a lady out of the blue who used to be part of my business networking company and I did promotional videos and she was in one of the videos and I got this message from her and I was just starting to reply, oh, g'day, we should catch up for a cup of coffee. And she wrote to me and she said, that promotional video of me promoting your company, I want it off the internet and I don't want anything to do with you ever again in your business. And I'm going, what? What have I done? And then I found out she had got involved in Hyperverse. Now, I could be vindicated by that lady and I could rub it in her face if I wanted to. Now, see her out. I'm not that way inclined. I love being right, don't get me wrong. But I mean, this lady was you know, 65 years of age. Um, she's a very successful business lady and she had put a ton of money into it. So I heard. I don't know. She hasn't told me. She's not talking to me. So, yeah, she may be red faced. She may be a bit sad about losing her money. And she might think that guy, um, Danny, was right. And she might be embarrassed. And she might want to avoid me. So, no doubt we've got situations like that in our life. But hey, life goes on. It's not what you did yesterday, it's what you do tomorrow. So, look for the future. I mean, look for ways. That having a passive income is quite good. It's something that we all really want. There's lots of opportunities on the internet. I mean, I remember, um, I'm not going to tell you actually. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to look at my notes here. Countless times I said, name and shame these people is the solution. You know, that's exactly what my YouTube channel is actually all about. I, I, I'm a bit comical because I can't take this seriously. And it's actually impossible to sit in front of a camera like this for five hours and be serious about something that you, you've got to take the funny side out of it. So you might think Danny's just trying to be a silly YouTuber. I really do not want people getting burnt by Ponzi schemes. People used to come along to my business networking and they used to try promoting people into get-rich-quick schemes. They used to encourage them to get involved in multi-level marketing. Uh, Brenda Chanda was saying that she had a coffee business. Uh, one of those, um, the coffee business she's talking about is one called Igano Gold. And when I heard that, I would have had about five people in my business networking companies um, you know, try to push that to my members. I asked them to leave. Another one was Arbon. Um, people coming, they've heard that Arbon was going to give them a um, financial independence. And I hate them. Anything to do with multi-level marketing. So yeah, I'm probably like a, 
a ball in a red flag, to be honest. When I saw this, um, two ex-members of my business networking company approached me. Um, my partner and I were looking for a place to live. We've both owned houses in the past, but we currently rent. And we're in the newspaper uh, because we were finding it really hard to get a rental because we our landlord was selling their old house. And this couple saw that we were in the paper and contacted me and said, look, I want to pick you up and take you to an investment opportunity, a meeting that's happening on Wednesday night. And I said, what is it, um, Kent? And he said, um, he said, oh, it's hyperverse. He wouldn't tell me until I asked him. I'm not coming unless you tell me. And I said, look, that's a Ponzi scheme. No, 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 it's all, it's part of my retirement fund. And no, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand crypto and all this sort of stuff. So anyway, my very first blog on my website, deheck.com, you'll see I named and shamed him. And that's, and his wife was also involved in it. So she got named and shamed. So I don't believe you should spend your time and energy trying to stop these guys and trying to get revenge or do justice. I believe that the, the powers, there's, there will be links in this um, description where you can actually fall out of form and complain to the authorities. I've been speaking to an investigator who specializes in um, financial crimes. And he's telling me that it's very hard for them to actually prosecute people outside their country. So he's in America. So he says they have to go to each country where the crime has been committed. So it's really, really hard to stop. That's my point. Um, yeah, so anyway, I would, um, my computer just went to sleep. That's not any good. Right, we're back. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so if it sounds too good to be true, it often is. So stay away from Ponzi schemes. And by all means, please like, hit the thumbs up. It helps these videos get out to the masses. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit that bell. And that will help um, this video get some traction. I'm sorry you've lost your money. I wouldn't spend your time and energy trying to recover your money. Um, maybe fill out a form. It shows the authorities that this is rampant. Um, you know, I'm even talking to a reporter of, of the Union, New York Times, from the New York Times, and he wants to do an article on Hyperverse, but he said it's a real tricky one to do because what do you write about? Is it Ponzi schemes in general? I mean, who's responsible? Who's got the money? Let's not continue. I'm Danny DeHeck, and you've been listening to the What The Heck podcast. And you've also been watching me on my YouTube channel, the Danny DeHeck YouTube channel. Thank you for subscribing. Please feel free to leave a message, a comment, and I'll do my best to get back to you. Have a great day, evening, or night.